The following is an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming. Hello, in today's show we are going to be soldering together a small stained glass panel. In a previous episode we learned how to cut, grind, and foil our pieces of glass so that we are ready to go on to this next step which is the soldering process. Solder is what holds the whole thing together. The copper foil that we put on is only a surface for the solder to adhere to. So that is what we want to do today. So in, pro, uh, in, in uh, preparation, I have cut all my glass. This is our basic uh, where we're headed. I've just made, uh, I've cut some glass in slightly different colors, but this is what the final end product is gonna look like. And this is what I really like about stained glass or any kind of art glass is that you can make the same project in different colors, different sizes, and it will always look different. It'll be a one of a kind no matter what you do. So I have got uh, these aluminum strips which have holes drilled in them and I'm using aluminum pins and the reason we do this is because the soldering iron is 700 degrees and if you're using plastic headed pins uh, they of course will melt. So uh, this can be lined up along the edge of your pattern. I have taped this down so that everything is nice and flat. I am going to start off in one side and I want to just barely be able to see the black line. So with that in mind I can just put a couple of pins in here. We don't need a to fill in all the holes. We just need a couple and I'll just continue along here and get the other four sides done. The reason I love this is because if you don't use these aluminum strips what you end up doing is taking a, uh, a wooden strip and hammering with nails and this just everything on your table is bouncing all over the place. So in this case, what I have is just a regular ceiling tile they would use in your basement or in an office setting. And as you can see, it's very easy to push the, uh, the aluminum pins into it. And you want to make sure that you're not, uh, you don't want to go on the outside of the black line because then everything will be a little too loose. Uh, and on the other hand, if you go on the inside of the black line, you'll find the pieces are just a little too tight. So this is going to work out really well. So this is an opportunity to have. I'm not too worried about exactly the way things are fitting right now because I'm going to have an opportunity to move them around for fine tuning once I get everything in place. So this circle, for example, I'm going to want to fine tune that a bit later. This is where you find out if you actually did do a good job of grinding. And this is why I usually don't put all the pieces <clears throat> on top of my pattern when I'm grinding. I just do one at a time. That way I can, uh, I can be pretty assured if everything is fitting in their individual openings, everything's going to be fine. Okay, so now we want to uh, apply flux. And what flux is, first of all, it's a wetting agent. And what that means is it allows the flux, or the solder, pardon me, when we apply it to flow nicely. Secondly, it will clean off any oxidization that is on the foil. Often the foil is months or perhaps even a year or so old and it's oxidized. So the flux will actually clean off that oxidization because you can only solder onto bare metal. It can't have uh, any kind of uh, contamination on top of it. So what I like to do is, is apply the flux wherever pieces join together. And the reason I do that is because I can remember where I did it. If I just go and randomly do it in the middle of you know, say a long line like this, I'm not going to remember exactly where I did apply that. Uh, the soldering iron, iron that I'm going to use is going to be at approximately 700 degrees. Uh, I would recommend that you look for a soldering iron that either has some kind of a control on it so you can adjust the temperature or one that stays at a constant temperature. You don't want an uncontrolled iron because it'll get super hot, it'll melt um, some of the different materials we're going to be using, the soldering and the, and the lead that we're going to put on later on. And it's, uh, this is a particularly nice one because I can adjust it down to a cooler temperature when I need a cooler temperature for putting the lead on the border, which I'll do at the end here. And I can turn it up if I uh, am doing something that requires more heat. You want a fairly small tip though. There's no advantage to having a big, wide, bulky tip. You want something that is relatively small. 
I suggest that you should hold your uh, soldering iron like a hammer, uh, as opposed to what my wife calls a, holding it more like a curling iron. Uh, as you can see, I don't have any use for a curling iron, so I've never used one of those tools. Uh, but the soldering iron, you hold it like a hammer, take a drop of solder, and you, can, you have your hand free. You can actually push these things over to the outside. And it's, to me, it's very <clears throat> critical. If you have any spaces, have them on the inside of your panel. You want to have a nice, consistent border on this so that uh, it looks properly finished. You're not going to notice a small irregularity in the center of the piece. Now, notice while I do this, there's a little bit of a, of a smoke that's coming up uh, from this, and that is caused by the flux. So there are a couple of safety issues that we should consider at this point. The first one is, well, heat, obviously. We want to make sure that we don't burn ourselves with the soldering iron. So uh, it's important to keep your fingers <clears throat> away from the iron while you're using it, although you do, over the years, learn exactly how close you can get without uh, causing it to burn. Uh, second of all, the solder that we're using does have an element of uh, lead in it. So this uh, solder that I'm using right now is called 50-50 solid coarse solder. So that means that there's 50% of the solder is lead and 50% is tin. So as I'm touching the lead, I am getting some of, or the solder, I'm getting some of the lead on my fingers. And it's, we want to be very careful that we don't get that into our mouths. So it's important that you don't eat while you're doing it, that you don't smoke while you're doing it and do everything you can to prevent bringing your hand up to your mouth and uh, perhaps putting the, the, uh, the lead into your, into your system. If you have an open cut, I would highly recommend that you uh, put a Band-Aid on before you start soldering. And by all means, if you want to wear um, any kind of gloves, any kind of uh, you know, surgical gloves, etc., great idea. Uh, the last safety issue is the uh, smoke that I was mentioning. And what that is, it's the flux that we're using. It's, it's just steaming up. And I find that 95% of the people do not have any issues with that, but you may find it an irritant to you. So I would highly recommend that you consider getting a fume extractor. And these are just a portable unit you can put right beside where you're working. Unfortunately, it makes a reasonable amount of noise, so I'm not going to use it now because it'll, be, uh, it'll interfere with our sound quality. So this is tacked together. Now at this point, I can actually pull out all of these pins because it's not going to, uh, nothing is going to move around because I have actually tacked it together well enough that it's, uh, it's, it's stuck together pretty darn good. As a matter of fact, I can actually just pick this up and move it around if I need to. Just that small amount of solder will do that. So at this point, if you're planning on using your pattern again, you could remove the pattern and uh, just work directly on your ceiling tile. Okay, so what I want to do now is I want to go over this once with, a, with uh, the 50-50 solder. And what that's going to do, it's going to fill any gaps I have between my pieces. Uh, the gaps are not necessarily a bad thing. Consistency is important. You want the gaps to be consistent. But getting some solder in between the pieces to fill in these gaps is not a bad thing. It's actually going to help uh, as far as strength goes. So what I want to do here is I'm just quickly going along here and I want to flat solder this and get a small amount of, I don't want to fill up the spaces in between the pieces of glass. So I'm resisting the temptation to bead this. And what beading means is the next process where I'm actually going to try and round it off. So right now I'm just relatively quickly going along and filling in these holes. So the reason I'm using 50-50 to do this is because 50-50 solder melts at a slightly higher temperature than the solder I'm going to use now, which is 60-40. 60-40 will generally bead a little nicer. So we like to use the 60-40 for beading, 50-50 for doing this initial uh, filling in the spaces. So a small amount of flux is, is now reapplied. If you use too much flux, you'll find that it spits a lot. And if you're getting bubbles in your solder, that's because you're using too much flux. So now, this is, there's some important points that I'd like you to, uh, to take note of. First of all, my soldering iron is right on top of the glass. I'm not holding it an eighth of an inch up, I'm touching the glass. If there is a flaw in the glass and it's going to crack, it's going to happen. Whether you're touching the glass or you're an eighth of an inch up, it's not going to make any difference. Second of all, I'm going to have my solder right underneath my iron. So my iron is on top. 
I am bringing it down onto the solder. And notice I'm not moving my spool of solder. I'm leaving it exactly where it is. Now I can see I've got a bit of a solder buildup, so I pull it away. And once that buildup has dissipated, I can pull the solder away again. And I'm going slowly, right? You don't have to go fast. You can go quite slowly. And what I'm trying to do, and this is working really well today, I'm getting a nice round bead. This is called uh, a beading your solder seams. And uh, your, your, your goal is to get a nice even amount of solder. And if you can keep in mind that it's not the solder, it's not you, you're not really controlling this process. The soldering iron is producing the heat, the, the flux is helping things to flow, and the solder, if you have the right amount, is going to automatically give you a nice bead. So all you're trying to do is to apply the right amount of, uh, of, of material at the right temperature. You don't go around and try and paint it on and try and use your soldering iron to affect the look. The soldering iron is just the method or the, the medium to get the uh, solder onto the foil. So as you can notice here, I've got a little too much solder there and definitely too much solder here. So all I have to do is just melt that one area and then just pull it away. So what I did is I melted it, I pulled it over the glass and I'm flicking it off. So in this case, it's a fairly big one, so I'm going to have to do it a couple of times. Now, as you probably noticed, some of these have fallen onto the glass. No big deal. The glass hasn't cracked, uh, but it's still 700 degrees, so don't try and pick it off too quickly. We're going to leave those there, and we'll pick them off later on. So just to recap, soldering iron right onto the glass surface, the foil surface. Solder, I am basically pulling into the solder. If you noted, I didn't actually reflux this and it seems to be working okay. If it stops working, I'll actually stop and apply some flux. But so far, so good. Although I think you can notice, and, and I, I think this is a good thing to point out, it, it just was not flowing as well as it should. You can see it started off okay here, but now it's actually bleeding over onto the glass more. So that tells me that yes, I definitely need more flux. So I got a little bit of flux on there. And now again, when I'm doing the touch-ups, I don't pull the solder at that point. I just go straight up and down. And if you look here and you can see there's that little bulge, when I do this, it just automatically beads up onto that solder, solder seam. So I'll just continue to the edge. And if you can remember, uh, stop a quarter of an inch away from the edge because we're going to put some lead came around the border as a frame. And if you go all the way to the edge and if you go over to the edge, then later on you're going to have to clean that off. Now the nice thing with a small uh, panel like this is you can keep moving it around so that you're always working right in front of yourself. So I'm going to now do this circle. And what I'll do is I will do the center of the circle first. You can hear a little bit of uh, the flux is, 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 uh, is spitting a little bit but not enough that it's causing me any problems. You'll always have a bit of a spitting sound. And I'm not worrying about what happens when I go past this. I'm just going to go back and I'll touch up some of those things later on. But again, I'm keeping the soldering iron right on my foil surface. So what I can do now is I can go back to wherever I've got these joins and I can just touch it up. If I've got too much solder, I can pull it over where I can use it. Uh, when you have a point like this, uh, this turquoise piece here, okay, first of all, I'll use my 50-50 and I'll do some flat soldering all along this line. Actually, I would, I would, if I was doing this piece um, in our studio, I would go along and I would flat solder everything first. So I don't have a lot of more glass to do here. Why don't I just take a moment and flat solder all of this? And again, I'm not too worried about what this looks like because I'm going to be going over it and beating it in my next step. Okay, so now I've got everything um, tinned. I'm going to go back and I would like to show you how to solder this line here. There's a sharp point here. And if I start pulling away from that, it will round off that point. And I want to keep that point because I was really concerned when I was cutting it that I would get a nice sharp uh, point in there. So I don't want to cover it with solder now. So as it turns out, this line is a little thin, so I don't need a lot of solder. When I get to this little point here, I'll just bring it over. 
And you can just keep going in any direction you want to. So as I'm going along, I'm just going along and doing those little lines there. Now, as I go here, I'm going to go right into this join. I'm going to let it melt so that the whole thing is molten. And I've got enough solder there. I'm just going to keep going right into that point. Okay, now I want to melt this a little bit just to see how much cleaner that looks now. And here also, I'm just going to touch it up. So what I want to do now is I'm just going to continue soldering this piece. And I do exactly the same thing on the back as I've done on the front. We want to beat it up. It's really important from a strength standpoint that you have your solder well, um, well beaded on both sides. And a lot of times people wonder, why am I going to this extent? Why don't I just get a thin layer of solder on it? And of course, the solder is what's holding this whole thing together. And uh, the foil is of no true value once the solder has been applied. So if we don't get enough solder on there to, uh, to cover the foil uh, properly, later on the foil will dry out, it'll pull away, and your piece will, uh, will have a much shorter life expectancy than it should. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to finish this piece off. I'm going to finish soldering this side, flip it over, solder the back exactly the same as I've done here, and then I'd like to show you how to apply a lead border. I'd like to tell you a little bit about skylights. Skylights are something that we see a lot in older buildings and they were a mystery to me for many years until I had an opportunity to go to San Francisco and take a glass restoration workshop many, many years ago uh, under the auspices of uh, Arthur Feminella, who is a, a well-known uh, stained glass historian. A very simple vaulted ceiling, often they can be more dome shaped like this one where they're actually in a complete circular setting. In this case, there are many sides to it. Sometimes they're more rounded. Skylights could be of two different varieties. They could be true skylights, in which case actually there was sunlight coming through them with uh, storm windows on the outside to keep out the weather, or like this one where they actually have backlighting. So these were built so they're an interior setting and there are um, light source, usually fluorescent tubes these days, uh, behind them to illuminate them. This is a beautiful vaulted ceiling. You can see that there's flat areas there's the, the vaulted area, and then of course there's the flat area right in the top. So get a wonderful, take note of the black lines. That is the steel frame, which I'm going to show you in a few minutes. It's the steel frame that's allowing these uh, panels to fight gravity. As you can imagine, gravity is always pushing things down. So if you're in a situation where you're putting glass in the ceiling, its natural nature would be to start slumping towards the floor. But these steel frames that are constructed. As you can see, there is the frame, which is made out of, in this case, bent metal. So there's a lot of geometry that goes into building these. You have to, first of all, make the metal frame. It has to be consistent all the way around because as, as much as possible, you don't want to be making each panel uh, different to fit into a, a unique shape. You want to have everything consistent as much as possible. When you look to the bottom left on here, you can see that they've got screws that are going into this frame, and then there's a little cotter pin that's going through a hole in that screw that's holding this in. Because of gravity, you don't have to have a molding at the back of this. You don't have to silicone them in. Um, gravity is holding them in place. You just want to make sure that they're not going to be slipping out of that space, which is what these uh, screws and cotter pins are doing for us. In this particular workshop that I took, we took out one of these panels and we did some restoration to it. So the first thing we did is we took one of the panels out and we made a cardboard template of the curve that we had in that particular piece so that we could then make a wooden frame that we could put the glass on to support it while we're working on it. So we use that cardboard template to make the ribs that you can see there. There are numerous ribs around here. There's actually one in each end and three in the center. So that when we put the stained glass on top of this material, it's called hemisote. It's a form of drywall. It bends very easily, which is why it was used for this particular purpose. This is going to hold the, the panels firmly in place while we're working on them. So as you can see, this piece now is on the frame. It's held in there very uh, firmly. Along with the metal frame, which is still intact in situ where we took this from, you can see that there are also metal reinforcing bars, we call them, that are put on the back of these particular panels. So this is a challenge too, because as you can see, they are rounded. So 
they either have to be bent or have to be cut into this shape. Um, not always an easy situation. If you look carefully at this panel, you can see there's some round pieces of glass. Those are jewels. And I don't know if you can see this on your TV screen, but there's actually indentations in the hemisote where those jewels um, from previous panels uh, had been placed. They're actually sticking proud of the bottom there. So that's one of the reasons that hemisote is used as opposed to plywood, because we can actually put some pressure down on those so that they sink into the hemisote and we can get a nice tight fit on it. So once this has been cleaned up in this case, these were very dirty. We took them out, we cleaned them up really well. There were a few broken pieces that were replaced and then it was put back into its home. So I hope that gives you a good insight into how we would repair some of these wonderful skylights from the, from the past. So I've had a chance to solder this panel completely front and back. And now what I'm gonna do is just push some of these solder blobs off. I'd mentioned that, you know, it's pretty hard not to get solder blobs on while you're soldering. So don't try and get them on off while they're hot. Wait till they cool down. Also, I'm going to check the border because the lead cane that I'm going to put on next will not slip over a high solder seam. So all of these are, are nice and flat, which is great. So lead cane comes in six foot lengths. This is not a six foot length. This is a three foot length. Um, I've cut this down already. They come in six foot lengths and you cannot get them home or even to your work table without them bending. So what you have to do when you get it home and just before you use it, you cannot do this a day before and then, um, then apply it the next day. It has to be done the same day. So we have a lead stretcher and a lead stretcher is basically a boat clamp. It's the same idea. So you open it up, you put your lead in here, you let it drop and it grabs onto that really tightly. And as you're pulling the lead from the other end, it will uh, uh, grab tighter actually. So uh, the probability of you flying off the other end is fairly slim. So what we do is we put the lead in here grab a pair of pliers and stretch from the other side. So as you can see, once you've done that, the lead is nice and straight and actually it puts a little tension in the lead so that it uh, is a lot easier to work with. So I've cut a couple of small pieces here and uh, with a small piece like this, a small stained glass panel like this, it's easy to just slip it in like that. And I like to continue using uh, these aluminum uh, strips because it gives you something nice and firm to push against. So I will go and I will add flux wherever the uh, lead border is gonna to touch onto a solder seam. This is now a good time, actually it's a little late, but I will turn this down to 360. Um, I had it at 410 to start off with, and I'm just gonna wipe it on my soldering iron cleaner here just to cool it down a little bit. Um, and now I wanna take one drop of solder. So I get a drop of solder, I put my solder on the lead and then I pull it over onto the solder seam. The first time it's gonna go a little flat, so then I'd put on a second drop and just pull it over. And that works out really well. If you think you're doing a messy job, don't try and neaten it up because all you do is push it um, you know, further in each direction and you just make a much messier job of it. So it's just a matter of going along and one drip at a time. Now you, you notice, of course, that I have left the lead long on each end. In this case, I left it longer than I had to. It just happened that the piece that I had to work with was about four or five inches longer than I needed. The tool that I use to cut the lead is called a lead nipper. And what is unique about a lead nipper, it looks like a side cutter that you'd use for cutting electrical wire but it's not, it's flat on one side. So when I'm cutting the lead, the flat side gives me a nice clean cut. You can notice it's clean there. If I use the other side, I get this notch kind of a cut. So that is not what I'm looking for. So I will uh, cut this piece. I'll figure out about how, well, how much I need. So I'll just cut this in half. I can now take this piece and put it on top of on this section. Again, I can push it against here, flux the corner, flux this first solder seam, get a drop of solder on it.
And I can now continue along and do the whole uh, side front and back. So that's what I'm gonna do right now. Charles Rennie Mackintosh was an architect in Scotland. He basically worked largely in Glasgow, although his work is throughout the British Isles, and actually Germany was an area that he did a fair amount of work also. You can see in this piece, he takes stained glass and he works it into all the other elements that he has in his buildings. He's like Frank Lloyd Wright. He would design the furniture, take care of the decorating, pretty much had a hand in everything that went into his buildings. So as you can see in here, some beautiful woodwork. This looks like it's a church organ, actually. You can see the ironwork, which has a very similar style to the stained glass windows that he had installed behind here. This was a set of doors that he did for a tea shop in Glasgow. And you can see where he's taking flowers and he's really stylizing them. And he was really well known for what's called the Macintosh Rose. And you can see that developing a little bit here. Again, these are doors for a piece of furniture, a wardrobe most likely. At that time, people didn't often have closets. They had wardrobes. So this is a wardrobe that he designed. And you can see, in this case, he was just using glass for color in here. There's no leading or anything. It was just used as a highlight of this piece of furniture. Here's one of his lamps and wonderful use of metal, especially. You can see how he's done the, the piercing in the four sides of the lamp. And then he's used, again, the glass for coloring. And you can see on the inside how he used a, probably a brass came actually. It looks very dark in this picture, but I bet it probably started off as, as a nice shiny brass and then darkened over time. Very nice design, very, very contemporary. I think something like this would probably look really in place in a lot of modern houses. And here we have his famous Macintosh rose. So you can see how he's taken it. He stylized it. This is a cabinet door. He used a lot of opalescent glass because he didn't want people to be able to peer in and see what was inside um, of his pieces. And he often used lead cane, but then they put solder over the whole lead surface. So you can see it gives a very irregular texture to that particular lead cane. And then here finally again how he's taken the Macintosh rose and used it in a different way. Now the last thing I want to do while I, as part of the soldering process is to attach two rings onto this piece. These rings are made out of uh, copper wire that's been tinned so they solder very nicely. So I'm going to put them on the back of my piece and again the solder is going to be 700 degrees so I need to have something to hold them so I'm using my grosier pliers. You can of course use any kind of household pliers too if you prefer. And it's important to get a good amount of solder on there and give it a little tug because if it's going to come off, we want it to come off now. We don't want to have an accident later. So I think we've got a lot accomplished uh, today on our show. We've, uh, we've soldered this completely front and back. We've talked about the different kinds of solder that you can use. And the only thing that's left with this piece is to put some patina on it. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put some black patina on it. And uh, then it'll be finished and ready to go. And actually our sample here has got the black patina on, so you can see how different it looks when you apply the patina as opposed to leaving it silver. And of course you could leave it silver if you want to. Some people find this attractive. However, it will dull over time. So what I'm gonna do in a, in a future show, I'm gonna show you how to apply the patina. As well, we put a wax on, so that will keep the, uh, the solder looking nice and shiny for a long period of time. Thank you for joining us.
The proceeding was an independently produced community access program. The viewpoints expressed are those of the community access producer and do not reflect those of Shaw Cable Systems. The program is presented in response to CRTC policy guidelines regulating community programming.